So I, I've done a couple of dry runs of this at, at local meetups, and I, I picked the title a while ago, but actually I think I should, I should change it. So the title is Issue with Tracking Fail That Build, but really I could call this How to Get Your Product Engineering Team to Care About Data Quality. Um, and how you can start building in some of that assurance. It's been really interesting over the last couple of days hearing people talk about what they're doing with data and thinking about how data quality has the opportunity to undermine that. And also talk, uh, hearing today about how others are, are looking at their, um, at their data offerings and thinking about the different steps at which they can introduce um, uh, data quality protections. So just to give you a little bit of scene setting. So I'm wondering who uh, recognizes this kind of situation. So your product team has been working on a product. They're really excited. They've been working on it for two to four weeks. They're, they're all ready to go. And they have a little celebration party. And they go, yeah, it's going to go. Good, it's gone. And probably someone in that crowd is thinking, did we ever get back to the tracking stuff? Um, and then, uh, yeah, certainly I, I, I recognize this. I've seen it. Um, and two weeks later, they go to the data team and say, oh, how's it doing? How's the, I can see a few laughs. I'm, I'm glad that it's, it's not just me who's been in this situation. Um, and they go to their data team and they say, how's it performing? And they, they say, I, I don't know what you expect me to do with this data. And uh, yeah, 10 million events saying uh, replace me and nothing else. Um, so yeah, it's good that, that a few of you recognize that and you, you've seen the same problems. And what this is doing, like the, the implications of this are big. It's beyond that moment. Um, and in fact, what, what I've, I've observed is, is a divide happening between product engineering and, and data teams, where uh, on the product engineering side, they're saying, OK, this is the moment that data go and start breaking things in Tag Manager. And the data team are thinking, well, product's just going to roll it out anyway. I don't really know why I'm here. So um, yeah, it, it, suddenly it's something that I've seen before. So. Um, yeah, my name is Steve Coppensmith. I'm head of engineering at Snowplow Analytics. We're a, a data startup uh, headquartered in London, but we have a fully remote team and customers across the world. Uh, we, we have built an open source uh, data pipeline, which is six, seven years old now. Uh, and as a service, we then deploy that into our, our customers' cloud accounts for them. Um, and I think there's around 150 um, uh, customers that we support at the moment. And before we go any further, I have a confession to make. I'm, I'm quite new to data. And in fact, most of my career so far has been spent in product teams pissing off data teams. So <laughs> I'm very familiar with the situation because uh, I, I have a, a wake of uh, uh, frustrated data teams um, behind me. But uh, I joined Snowplow 10 months ago, and I'm since a reformed character. And I, and I really appreciate um, what, what the, the trials and tribulations of a, a data team working on poor quality or poor structured data, uh, the, the types of things that they have to, to handle. So I'm, I'm here to say that uh, the tracking is as important as the feature you're shipping, so test it. And that's a message that, that we need to be taking back to product teams. Uh, product teams already do quite a lot of testing around their feature, but we just don't see that extension into the tracking strategy, and it causes a lot of pain, a lot of investment downstream. So Snowplow is big on data quality. Uh, schemas, uh, schemas and, and structured data are a cornerstone of our offering. And uh, we also have a lot of work uh, around identifying bad rows, so bad data, keeping that out of, the, uh, out of the storage targets and out of the modeling process, but also putting it somewhere that you can recover it. That event was, was if, unless it was generated by a bot, bot or a spider, um, it was something that you intended to keep. And we've got, we're just at the tail end of a lot of uh, work on, on our bad row format and allowing us to do more, more with, that, with that bad data. We also offer QA pipelines, so whether it's um, a, a customer of ours, whether it's someone in the open source community, they could spin up a full version of the pipeline, and then they could put that against their staging environment, have a look at the events going through it, and see whether they're seeing what they expect before they push it out to production. But while we have a lot of automation on the top line there, we don't offer a lot of automation on the bottom line. And, uh, and it's an arduous process. So to give you a little bit of context, this could be anyone's um, pipeline, but just to show you the, the point that we started from at Snowplow. So on the leftmost side, we have our tracker um, embedded in, in a website or in an application, emitting events to a collector. From the collector, they get put into a stream. From there, they get picked up uh, and validated uh, against the schema repository. If they fail validation, they'll go through into the bad stream and, and into a bad, uh, bad row storage. 
if they pass that step, they go into enrich. Just to keep simplify the, the diagram, I haven't put all the various places that something could become a bad row, but uh, it goes through to the enrichment step into another stream and then into the loader target and then into the modeling phase. So there's, there's a lot happening there. And um, some of the, the challenges to, to the QA process around this is that this infrastructure takes minutes to spin up, which is impressive, like rewind like a couple of years and it would have taken weeks for us to spin it up manually. We've invested a lot of time in this, but it still takes us minutes to, to spin up this architecture. Um, it has a lot of the steps that we don't need to test. So the vast, vast, vast majority of, of uh, bad rows we, we find uh, are generated at validation. Um, unless we have a, an outage down, uh, downstream in the, the loader or in the enrichment step, that's gonna, gonna cause a lot at the same time. But more often than not, the, the issue is going to occur at validation. So there's a lot of steps there. If we're picking up events when they get to the, the storage target to know whether they've been successfully tracked or not, then um, yeah, there's a lot of things there where it's unlikely to fail, so we don't really need to test that bit. It can take minutes for an event from the moment that it's been emitted to the moment that it's gonna hit the, the storage target. We've got many places to query. We've got the bad rows bucket, we've got the target. Um, it, there's quite a lot of different interfaces there that we would have to get our heads around if we wanted to try and automate this process. Um, and also it's quite costly to run. So uh, for anyone who's done um, feature driven development before, like you, you know that you need your own environment in order to be able to test against it. You don't want to be running your test against the dependency at the same time that someone else is running a test against the same dependency because something they're doing may fail your test and vice versa. And in, in feature tests, it's the same as, as data. The moment that you lose trust in it, the moment you lose, um, it loses its value. And uh, that, the, you know, the test fails and you think, well, it, it was probably meant to succeed. It probably would succeed in other days. So we're gonna push it out to production. So there's some of the challenges that we had. We wanted to improve our own internal um, testing processes. So we, we built something um, to help us. And this is called Snowplow Micro. We released this, it's an open source uh, project. Uh, we released this a few months ago now. And it's the smallest version, possible version of a Snowplow pipeline, um, specifically the collector and the validation step. So that's all it is, it's, it's the collector and validation. They're the two things that we, we see fail more, most often, either non-compliance to the tracking protocol or to one of the schemas that you're trying to track. And in that, in that application, um, we have two endpoints that we can query. Um, we actually have three, I should put the other one on here. But we, we have a, a, the ability to see which good events and which bad events the, the Snowplow Micro has received. And all of those are stored in memory. So this small version takes seconds to spin up. Um, it takes split seconds for an event to arrive from being emitted to, to arriving um, behind one of those APIs. Uh, it's very simple to query. We've got one endpoint with, um, or three endpoints on the same application. We have a good one that shows all of the good events, bad one that shows any bad events that were received, and there's a third one, it's at slash all, which just shows us a tally. So it will say that we received 20 events, three of them were, were um, bad, 17 were good. Um, it's also a single executable, which is really important for flexibility. So, what I'll, I'll go on to talk about in a minute is about spinning this up as part of your automated build process. So having a single executable jar that you can just kind of uh, spin up anywhere is really important if you then want to embed that into any automated test runner. Uh, and minimal cost as well. It's really small. Uh, you, can, you can run it on your laptop, no problem. You still get this performance. You still get split second performance. Um, so yeah, Mike, Micro has helped us to unlock kind of a new, a new style of testing for data quality that we, we didn't have before. And what it allows us to do is to write automated tests um, that sit outside of, outside of Micro and outside of the, the application or the site that you're testing. And what they can do is to drive the, the website. So who, has anyone used an automated like, uh, web testing framework before, like uh, Selenium or Cypress? So some familiarity. So um, the, what they'll do is they'll drive the, the journey through the website. So they'll behave as a user behaves. And then they'll, they'll um, what they're designed to do is then to test that the website acts in the way that you expect it to. Um, but also you can write out some custom assertions. And uh, we're using those custom assertions to then validate um, against Micro to see through that user journey which good and bad events were sent. So the framework that I've been using to test this with is Nightwatch.js. Anyone heard of Nightwatch? 
It's one of the lesser known automated testing frameworks. I, I like it because it's cross-browser, um, which is great. Like we're currently using Micro and Nightwatch to test the impact of ITP, um, which, is, which is really good. And plus, we made some changes to our collector recently that were ITP related. So we were able to see whether that works in, in Firefox, Safari, IE, and Chrome. Um, it's easy to extend once you've figured out how to extend it. The, the real downfall of Nightwatch is the documentation is really poor compared to the other um, players in the space. But once you know how to do it, it's quite easy to, to, to break it open and to um, break out of the normal cycle, which is just you know, running through a website and seeing uh, you know, performing actions there and, and, and go and do something else. It also has by far the cutest logo. So this is a, a Nightwatch test. Um, I, uh, this is the, the shared laptop. I, I've put, pushed this into slides. I think word got around that when I did this at uh, a data council meetup in London, the demo failed miserably. So I pushed it into to slides. Um, so I'll just talk you through the test a little bit for context. So this is a test that's going to add multiple products to my, my e-commerce stores cart. So the first line there is going to click the link to, to see the, the shirts. This is the clothes shop. Um, it's going to change the quantity to, to two, so I want to buy two shirts. The third line there is going to add that item to the cart. What the site's going to do is take me then to the basket, and I want to check that the shirt is in the basket. So under the, the, um, the div on the site that has the ID cart, I want to make sure that the, the text shirt is in there. It's not the best test, but I wanted to make something nice and short so I can show you how I would, I would extend it. So thinking back to the product team, like they see this test passed, right? Everything's working. Like This is brilliant. Our feature is complete. Um, and they'd be right if this is all they're going to test. So what we've been doing um, using Nightwatch and using Snowplow Micro is to extend uh, the Nightwatch framework to add in this function, uh, which is called no bad events. All this is doing is it's checking that slash all endpoint, which returns that uh, JSON object that says how many good and bad events are in there. And it's checking whether bad events is equal to zero. And if they'd have run this, then they would have seen that they had 10 million events saying replace me and nothing else. Um, so yeah, this this if you if you do something like this, so it's a, what I want to talk to you about today is Snowplow agnostic. It's testing framework agnostic. This is really about behaviors that I think we should start trying to to inspire and incentivize in in the product engineering process. And if all they could do is this, is to decorate their automated test with did I send any bad events? This would this would see off like fifty percent of the the tracking um, outages that we see. Um, through through just invalidated um, uh, non non compliance to schemas, so yeah, this this could be all that we ask them to do. But we have extended it further for the you know really keen teams or the teams who really uh, the teams who really uh, um, care about data quality. So we've also got the ability through Nightwatch and Snowplow Micro to to check whether. Of the good events, did I receive the ones that I was expecting to receive? So here, I've abbreviated it slightly, but I'm expecting to see two events um, that are cart events. So this, this test would actually fail in the, the site that I'm testing. And the reason is, uh, you know, that when I see this, if I'm a software engineer and I'm writing this, and I go, OK, that failed. I only got one. I, I should have got two. So I can go back to the, the code and talk to the engineer who wrote it, maybe talk to the data team, and they'll say, no, you've, you've misunderstood. If we change the quantity, we still send one event, but we send quantity of two as a value. So I can extend my test and make sure that's true. So now, not only am I making sure that I get the that I've sent no bad events, that I've sent that I'm receiving the types of event, event that I expected to in the right quantity, but I'm also checking the values that are set within them. So if there's any key bit of data that you really need to track, like this is a really you know it's a really good investment of time to to put this in there and make sure that you're going to get that when you come to use the data. Maybe when I sit down with my data team, they might say, hey, your test is passing, but you know what, don't forget the context. Like, this is something that we, we talk to, to customers a lot about, um, and, and people in the open source community, about making sure that contexts have been attached to, to events. It seems to be an area that, that, that tends to fall down quite often. Um, so I may, may decide to extend this. And this is actually an array, so I can put in lots of these um, option uh, objects to, to test whether all of these schemas are there. So it's going to iterate through the context that are attached to this, uh, the schemas, uh, to the events. And it's going to check that I have context of a certain type. And I could also check the values of those contexts as well. So in this case, having sat down with the data team, they've told me that um, 
Not only do I need uh, one cart event with a quantity of two set as a value, I also need to attach a context of type product entity that has uh, a value, a values in there that have a name, name of shirt and color of white. So, so that's just an example. That's, that's all the code that I'm going to show. I do have a, a demo, which last time I checked worked. Um, and I'll, I'll show that in the office hours, and I'd be really happy to show this um, working. Because one thing to note is that um, I was talking before about the QA process. If you think about how long it would take to to go through the website, click on the events that you wanted, the, the, uh, click on the journey that you expected to have, uh, wait for a few minutes for those events to end up in your storage target, then go and identify where, where isolate those events and find out where they were. Um, and then go through them one by one and make sure that they have the right context attached and those contexts have the same value. No one's going to go through that effort. But of course, that means that we have um, uh, you know, poor data quality when we come to do our decisioning at the end or our analytics at the end. So um, yeah, it's this, this process, uh, I, I'll, um, I'll show it working during the office hours. Uh, you, you hardly see it happen. The, the, it spins up a browser, it goes through the journey, um, web journey, Sets against the API, I think you know, this, this test would take less than a second to run. And when it becomes less than a second to run, uh, people are going to do it. So this goes really beyond building assurance around the feature that you're shipping. And there's a few reasons why I say that. Um, one is that it's not just about the feature that you're shipping. If you have lots of independent teams working on their own um, threads, they might be writing tests as they go. But your test is always out there in perpetuity being run. So you're not only assuring that your functionality is emitting the right data today, you're assuring that, that it's going to be emitting the right data in perpetuity. And the moment that someone breaks it, that build doesn't go out to production. We're also shorting, shortening the learning cycle. So thinking back to that team who were really happy that they'd finally pushed out their product, their MVP, and they wanted to see what the data said and how it was performing. This is what the learning cycle tends to look like. So you, you have your development process. You desperately add some, some tracking at the end to try and satisfy the data team. Uh, two weeks later, you find out it's wrong, and you make some corrections. Two weeks after that, you find out it's still wrong, and the process continues. And your learning objective gets further and further out. You won't know whether your, your test is passing. And that's when it tends to be rolled out to production anyway. But if you define that tracking up front, and if you sit down with your, if the product en uh, engineering team sits down with the data team to think, to talk about it and to document it and put it down somewhere um, in a way that you can then automatically test against it and assure that it's always going to work that way in the future, um, so you get all that benefit, but, but it really shortens the learning cycle because you define the tracking strategy at the start. Your engineers are all the time considering that tracking strategy as they're working. And then they watch the test pass, the tests will pass, now they can push to production with confidence. And confidence that in a couple of weeks they're going to get the answers that they were looking for. So now I'm going to show that I haven't um, spent a lot of time working with happy data teams, because I don't really know what they say in this instance, but I imagine they'd say something like best data ever. Um, and it's really important, I think, for us to try and stitch those teams back together. I think a lot about the, the what they have to learn from each other if they can collaborate more effectively. One thing that I've found moving from product to data is that we're trying to solve the same problems, and it's really important to stitch those teams back together. And I think you know, taking the same care and attention over the tracking strategy and the, and the data strategy as, as you do over the feature strategy is a really important component of that. So really, we want to get to this position. Now, I know that it will be a lot of investment for a team to, to decorate all of their feature tests, especially if they with, with um, tracking tests, especially if they want to go down to the level of testing contexts and testing which values are set in those contexts. Um, but it's a, an important investment. Eng product engineers are already investing in these other things. They're already investing in linting, in unit tests, in features. Um, and they should be investing the same in tracking if they want the answer to the question, uh, how is my, my new feature doing in a couple of weeks? So if tracking's not OK, it needs to fail the build. You don't want to be pushing that out in, into production. So I was hoping to finish a little bit earlier to let you guys go to lunch a bit earlier, and I have. Uh, that's the end of the, the talk, but I will um, take some questions now if anyone has any.
Hey, thank you very much. Uh, we were just talking about how great this talk is because this is a, a lot of the challenges that we face on our, our uh, respective teams are around this. Um, uh, so I'm actually starting to pitch a, a very similar project to uh, in our company, um, like within my team for this. And I'm just wondering, like, what's the best way to, I guess, convince product engineers that, you know, I, I, it's something that you focused a lot in your talk, but I'm curious, I was like, what, how, yeah, how do you convince teams to, to really bake this into their development process? Because it's a, it's a big change for engineers all of a sudden to have to kind of worry about data or like if testing data when, when they're developing their product. So, um, you know, I'm trying to make the best case that I can for engineers to, to focus on this. So, like, yeah, how do, how do you pitch that? Yeah, it's a great question. I, and I think there's, there's two main areas. One is is that they're already putting the same amount of investment in other things. Like this, what, what, what we're suggesting that they try to do with testing the tracking strategy is no different to what they're doing already with testing that the feature works. So, so it's the same arguments, right? Why invest so much in unit testing? Why invest in so much in feature testing? It's because once you've put in that effort, it pays back in perpetuity. And also, you can then engineer with confidence. Like you, can, you can move on to your next thing knowing that your tracking strategy was OK and you're not going to have to come back and fix it. So the argument there is the same. But I think the bigger argument is, do you want to be a data-driven business? Like, if you want to be a data-driven business, you need to invest in data quality. If you want to be, if you want to have that level of trust in your data and then the immediacy of that, that decision to push something or not, then you need to make sure that you're emitting the right stuff up front. So I think it's really those two things. They're already investing the same level of, of, uh, of time in, in other strategies for exactly the same reasons. And if you want to be a data-driven business, then you need to take every opportunity to make sure that you're generating first-time data quality. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned um, that it would take a few minutes um, in this process, in the pipelines, until it reached the target, which is the data warehouse. Or um, My question is about real-time data. How do you deal with this, and how do you test the latency, and how do you try to improve that? That's interesting. So on the on the full, I think the question is on the full pipeline. How do you test latency? Yes, yeah, so we we have um, other test rigs that we use internally for that. So we use a tool called Locust, uh, which can emit huge volumes of data, but it will spread it out like it, it'll it's like a load testing framework. Um, and yeah, we we then monitor the pipeline end to end to see. There's lots of variables, so it's hard to say like every pipeline will deliver an event in this amount of time. Um, because it depends what enrichments you're using, it depends what your autoscaling strategy is. Our, you know, whoever sets up our pipeline, whether it's customer or open source, have a lot of options. So it's quite hard to come down to a definitive number. But uh, yeah, we, we have another test rig which fires in uh, realistic data at the front, and then we can measure the distance between the, the time, the collector timestamp, and when it was loaded. And we, we're trying, we're actually investing a little bit more in this now. So we're, we're really looking at the observability of our estate. So what we do at the moment is that we get a lot of that met those metrics from our infrastructure, but our applications are the best source of truth. They know the exact moment that they did something. So we're looking to emit those events out into, we, we obviously have Snowplow pipelines internally as well, so we emit those events out and then we're aggregating those and showing our customers the, the performance, of their, uh, performance of their pipelines. Hey, uh, thank you. This was like really interesting talk and I echo uh, what they said that this is solving a very fundamental problem for I think a lot of companies, especially like Snowplow, Micro Suns, awesome. Uh, I was wondering if there was anything that also plugs into the framework which helps with uh, documentation as well. So if the product team is already investing a lot of time in terms of um, declaring what the event should look like and what they're capturing in terms of like for testing purposes, it would be amazing if that could also plug into some sort of like auto-generated documentation for then the people who are analyzing the data. So I was wondering if there was already something that plugs in there I, or if, there, if that's something that you already address with some of your clients. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's on the radar. So we, we have in our, our um, Insights UI, we call it, we, we have some areas where we can socialize things like schemas, but we're really socializing the thing that the application uses in order to be able to assert whether something's valid or not. What we're losing a little bit there is some of the meaning behind it. And, and that, that, you know, that gets lost between if you have things like staff turnover, you, someone might 
to find the events, then two years later, they're not around anymore and you need to change that event, but you're not quite sure why it was created, what the purpose is, how it's being used. So we, we've had just had a big focus on data quality. We know one of the things that we want to focus on next is data meaning. So it's actually capturing some of that metadata around the way that the pipeline is set up, the way that the schemas are defined. Because right now it's very ad hoc. If, if uh, um, someone wants to do that around um, Snowplow, then they would need to create their own set of, of documents somewhere. But again, easy to lose, easy to get outdated. So we're looking to, to keep more of that on kind of the habitual path and, and keep it up to date. Um, but I th so you mentioned Snowplow Micro. It's really uh, one point that I wanted to make. Like, Snowplow Micro aside, if you're rolling your own, pipeline, you may have the same opportunity. One nice thing about the Snowplow solution, which if you can do the same thing, is that the code that's in micro for collecting and validating events is exactly the same code that's in production. So that gives us a high level of assurance that if it works either locally when an engineer is testing it, or if it works in the, the automated testing environment, then it's going to work in production. Um, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're using Snowplow, you've got Micro there. If you're rolling your own, try and build the same thing. If you're using a you know, hosted SaaS vendor, try and pressure them to do the same thing, provide some kind of interface that's gonna give you that quick response of am I doing the right thing? Because I really believe that this strategy is needed. I, I believe it's overdue, and I believe it's one of the reasons why, why we're starting, why I've observed, and, and I can saw a few nodding heads, that kind of divide between data engineering and product engineering teams. Hi. Uh, yeah, I really like the approach, uh, like really trying to stop like bad code from happening on the, on the first time. I was wondering, like with a lot of companies now moving like microservices and a lot of those also being event driven, there is like a lot less distinction between like tracking code and just like messages that, that the, uh, uh, the services are using uh, anyway, right? Like that's really like necessary for, for just the application to work. So I was wondering if you have any views on that and how this uh, could help on that scenario. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the approach is, is applicable. So a lot of the web frameworks were automated testing frameworks, uh, post-date a lot of server-side automated testing frameworks. I remember back in the day uh, when I worked for British Telecom, we were using something called Fitness, um, which is an automated test running runner for testing against uh, applications. And um, yeah, it's it's the same approach. So we we have one of the benef one of the things that we we. Uh accommodate in the Snowplow pipeline is that we have trackers for iOS, Android, and, and the web ones that you would expect to find. Um, but we also have, have a lot of server-side trackers. And the reason is so that we can start to emit events from applications as well. So if you have, for example, a product pricing change, you're not trying to infer that from what a user might be able to see on the website. You're instead emitting that from the source of truth and saying, this just happened. Um, so yeah, you could absolutely do the same thing against any event that was emitted by by a uh, server-side application.